beat up. That's what happened. Yeah, I always, uh, <clears throat> I understand connection. I mean, a lot of times you look at something and someone easily is just hitting air <laughs> or their hand. No and I mean, yeah, no it, if you want to, if you're watching a movie, you don't want to see Tom Cruise or even back in the day like Clint Eastwood <laughs> punch his hand when he hits somebody. No, no. Hey, hey listen, the, 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 the guy that taught me the most about punching, well, two guys actually did really help me out a lot. Uh, he was like a father figure to me, and, and uh, but Bruno, uh, Bruno grabbed me once, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, patting myself. I, I threw a pretty good punch uh, when I learned how to do it, once I learned how to do it. Uh, uh, but Bruno said, let me ask you something. If you're in a fight, are you going to stomp your foot when you throw a punch? <laughs> I said, you know, I never thought of that. No, I'm God, not going to do that. Not. He said, well, then don't do it when you go out there. He said, don't do it when you go out there. And, and what used to happen for for a newer guy, and, and all of us were newer guys at one time or another, right. uh, you know, you get an old timer come up to you after your match, because almost everybody watched. Almost everybody watched. That was a really good way to learn. You know, maybe steal, maybe steal a move from somebody, or, or see how to do something the right way. Uh, and an old timer would say to you, uh, "Hey, listen, you mind if I give you a little constructive criticism?" You know, so if you are a real ass, you said, "Oh no, please do." You know what? And he'd take you never in front of the guys. They take you walk you into a shower or somewhere else, and say, "Listen, I saw you throw this punch. Why don't you try to do it like this?" Or, or, you know, if you're not really good at it, here, try this, and this will work. Uh, you know, guys like that, uh, Blackjack Lanza helped me out with that, Don Jardine. You know, it, it, so many of the old-timers, and, and it, was, it was a good business for the fans because Greg Valentine said it best, man. They, they believed because we believed. Right. We, we believed what we were doing. We believed what we were doing. Absolutely. Never make a joke out of what we did for a living. Right. I mean, I, can, I, I can't quite understand, you know, doing it for a living because I was just, you know, the weekend warrior stuff. But, I mean, I'm sure doing it, you know, in and out for, was it like 16 years you had? That's that's some serious business. 19 years I was. 19 I years. Wow. That is amazing. And, and my body is showing it, you know. Uh, right. I've had, I've had. I think 14 or 16 major orthopedic surgeries. Wow. Uh, I've, I've lost my hearing uh, from, from getting hit in the head. Uh, my right ear is, I'm totally deaf, except I hear noises in it all the time. You know, I oh, always say wow. to my wife, what? She said nothing. I didn't say anything. You know? Oh. Or I'd say, what was that? And she'd say, what was what? You know, uh, uh, my, my good friend Pedro, uh, uh, wiped out my right ear on me. Uh, just, uh, just the, the hardest hit I ever took uh, from Pedro. It was, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, so we believed. We believed, and night after night, it was, uh, it was a grind. And uh, you know, you, if you were sincere about the business, uh, you you provided the same product uh, in, in a little tiny town or a high school gym, or a, a, a VFW hall, as you did in Madison Square Garden, yeah. or Boston, or, or Chicago, or wherever else you went. Same thing. You know, you, you didn't cut it uh, cut it uh, short, because those people pay the same prices, and some of them saved their money to get to see you wrestle, and, and that was our obligation to them. <clears throat> so when you said Pedro, were you talking about Pedro Morales? Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Pedro was a, a really, really close friend of mine. Uh, eventually became, you know, two miles away was my neighbor. You know, we uh -huh. go back. And then Pedro's another guy that I actually got to work with in the business that I watched work in the old Madison Square Garden when I was a kid. You know, that that's the part for me that's, uh, that's kind of surreal because the guys right. I used to watch and guys that were my idols that I'd say, oh, my God. We're still in the business when I started. So, I, you know, I wrestled Pedro and Haystacks Calhoun and Bobo wow. Brazil and uh, Miguel Perez and, you know, 
and my close friends, Manny Soto, Johnny Rods, Pete Sanchez, uh, you know, guys like that, Dominic, uh, you know, guys like that uh, were, still, were still active. But Pedro and I were working one night, and I forgot that he was left-handed. <laughs> and, you know, I was doing my heel stuff. Yeah. And, and one of the rules we have uh, in the ring is, you know, you don't let somebody slap you unless you call it. Because a slap is an insult, right. and, and that, you know, if somebody does it on their own, uh, that usually uh, is the start of a little scrimmage in the ring there. But uh, I said to Pedro as I was working on him, I said, when you come back, give me the biggest slap you possibly got. <laughs> and I'm watching his right hand, thinking, okay, here it comes, <laughs> and crash oh, He hits me with a left on the ear. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> He hit me so hard that uh, uh, King Kong Bundy and Tito Santana were in the dressing room. And uh, when I was leaving the ring, I saw them shake their head and they were walking back in. And Bundy said to me, that wasn't a, he says, that was the loudest slap I ever heard. I said, yeah, well, it was on the side of my face and my ear. I said, how's it look? He says, well, your ear looks a little swollen up. Yeah, no kidding. A little. little small enough. And, and, you know, years later, uh, uh, just a, a little sad note, uh, Pedro's son passed away years ago. And, you know, a bunch of us, of course, went over to pay our respects. And, you know, at that point, Pedro was already in a wheelchair and, oh. and really having problems. But with my hearing, he was talking to me. And I bent down and I said, Pete, I said, I can't hear you. He said, what happened, brother? Somebody slapped you on the ear? I said, yeah, somebody, <laughs> slapped, me on, somebody slapped me on the ear. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. He was, you know, another guy that I miss uh, uh, was, was really something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so many good ones have passed on. <clears throat> and you made a great point yeah. about getting to work with guys. That was a great point uh, of my short time, too, was uh, getting to work with guys like Kamala and Honky Tonk Man, Jake the Snake. And uh-huh. it, it just really was uh, mind-blowing and hard to believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it, it, like I said, for me, I mean, I was I was a dyed-in-the-wool wrestling fan. And, and at seven years old, uh, I was saying I want to be a professional wrestler. Oh, wow. you know, I had no idea how to do it or, or yeah. what, what to do, but you know, I, I you know eventually had some wrestling background. You know, I wrestled in school and high school and college, and so I you know I knew how to wrestle, uh, but I didn't know anything about professional wrestling. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I snuck into an arena in Kansas City and, and lied to the promoter and told him that. Uh, uh, Arnold Scolan sent me out here to so <laughs> give me some work. And, and Gus Paris looked at me and said, you're in the business? I said, yeah. Oh, well, okay. Okay. But I only did that because I used to bug Scolan and, and the guys in New York so much. Uh, they said to me finally, including George Steele, uh, said, you know what, kid? Go to college. Uh, when you're finished college, come back and see us and we'll uh, help you be a wrestler. So I was in college in Missouri, and I said, well, this might be an opportunity here. And uh, I got on the bus, went to Kansas City. Uh, I had an empty suitcase, uh, went to the arena at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, banged on the door. And Usher said to me, uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm a wrestler. He said, oh, wow, you're early. I said, yeah, yeah, well, I just got in town. He let me in, and I sat in the dressing room until the guys started to show up not knowing what I was going to do, of course. Mm. And and the first two guys that walked in, uh, the first two were actually Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch were working out there as the outlaws. Uh, and, they, you know, they came in and, you know, courtesy in our business, you introduce yourself to somebody yeah. you don't know. And they introduced themselves to me, and uh, that was that. Uh, and then a little later, uh, Gus Karras, who was the promoter, and... Uh, Texas Bob Geigel came walking in and, you know, immediately said, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, yeah. I said, well, I said, Arnold Scolan sent me in from New York. Uh, you know, I was going to be out here in school and 
and they said you could give me some work. And and Gus Carr said, well, you mean you're in the business? You know, I think Bob Geigel was already getting smart to me. Mm. Uh, so uh, I said, yeah. He said, okay, we'll hang out and we'll see you after the show. And uh, and Bob Geigel actually set me up in a in a hotel that night in Kansas City where where all the guys stayed and bought me breakfast in the morning and uh, said to me, well, I'll tell you what, uh, be down in Sedalia, Missouri, uh, Tuesday night, and uh, and we'll put you in that ring and uh, and let you get going. So I did. <laughs> that was mm-hmm. it. I had no idea about the business. It was not smart. They don't smart me up back then. Uh, and they put me in there with a guy that absolutely cleaned my clock. <laughs> Turned me every way but loose. I mean, he was unbelievable. He didn't hurt me, uh, but uh, I knew that he could anytime he wanted to. Uh, but you know, that's so there. Well, like I said, no wrestling schools. Uh, and then I, then I, eventually, uh, spring break or whatever the hell it was, I uh, came back to uh, New Jersey where I live, and uh, I went to a wrestling show and said to Arnold Scolden. Hey, Gus Karras sent me out here and said, uh, you could give me some work. <laughs> and Skull, and Skolden said, you're in the business? I said, oh, yeah. You know, I, I had, I think, four or five matches by then. Still wasn't smart. <laughs> still didn't know how to work. And Skolden said, uh, all right, kid. He said, uh, Tuesday night, uh, be in Philadelphia for TV. <laughs> and, and I did. I went down and... Uh, I was actually Tony Garea's first match in the territory. So, yes, that's wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, it, it was a different way to get in the business. Uh, but you know, uh, a little by little after that, uh, uh, because I guess I had a decent attitude, uh, they booked me and uh, uh, the guys taught me and, and took me under their wing and uh, and treated me uh, very well, very well. <clears throat> Yeah, I saw a couple of <clears throat> other men that you worked with that were some known uh, real uh, shooting workers. It was Danny Hodge and uh, Luthez. Those were some true oh, legends. Uh, that, was, that was my second and third match. Yeah. <laughs> that my had to be match was, Yeah, my first match was a guy named Joe Scarpello. Uh, Joe Scarpello was uh, an AAU champ, NCAA champ. Not a big guy, about 5 feet 8 inches tall, uh, maybe 210 pounds. You know, I was playing football in Missouri at the time. I was 260 pounds in really good shape. Uh, and that very first match in Sedalia, uh, again, not being smart. You know, the, they didn't, the, the old timers didn't tell you about the business. You were, you were just a new punk. You were lucky you were even sharing a dressing room with them. And uh, we got in the ring, and I, I had heard guys talking, and I was picking up uh, little terminology and little words and things like that. And uh, the referee was a real uh, crusty old-timer named Ronnie Etchison. And uh, he says, okay, kid. He says, you know, we'll get about six or seven minutes here. And I said, are we shooting or are we working? Now, I know what shooting meant because I was an amateur. Yeah. I had, I had no idea what work meant. <laughs> I had no idea, but uh-huh. I heard somebody say it. And Ronnie Etchison... And he had a really gravelly voice. He sounded like he had an ice skate stuck in his throat. <laughs> he said, "He said to me, or he said, I heard him say, oh, Christ, just like that. And Joe Scarpello looked up at me and said, take your best hold, kid. <laughs> oh, oh, really? I didn't, I didn't know I had a best hold, which I, which I didn't. Uh, and man, he just tied me up. You know, I didn't know he was an amateur. I could protect myself, of course, because I knew what to do. Uh, but I'm saying to myself, well, crap, this is not what I saw on television. Wait a minute here. Yeah. So uh, after the show, I was sitting in a dressing room with my head in my hands and my elbows on my knees. And Joe Scarpello walked by me, kind of gave me a little slap on the back of the neck and said, yeah, see you tomorrow, kid. And a little voice in my head said, I'm not too sure about that. I don't, I don't know if we're going to do this again. Right. Uh, but, but sure enough, I did. And Bob Geigel said to me, well, listen, uh, Friday night, uh, we do TV. Why don't you come up there? 
That was in St. Joe, Missouri. 